everyone in the US. Uh, my name is Rock Schrieber and I am a general manager of high performance programs at ACA. I joined ACA in April this year and all I can say, what a ride. I mean, I did not imagine that COVID is gonna hit just a couple of days or a couple of weeks perhaps prior to me joining ACA and it changed everything. It literally changed everything. Um, first, what we saw was postponement of the Olympic Games. It was a, it's the first time ever that the games have been postponed. Following on, on postponement of the games, what we, another thing that we observed and saw was cancellation across the board. All the events, were either postponed initially, then canceled. So the whole uh, sport world was put upside down. Um, as you can see here, uh, at the end of the day, canoe and kayak were pretty lucky, if I put it that way. We still managed to squeeze by one World Cup on the sprint side. And, and para canoe side, and then one World Cup so far on the slalom. One more is scheduled for November 6th through 8th. I hope it will happen. Although right now, as you probably know, the situation in Europe uh, with regard to COVID is um, alarming, if to say the least. Um, so when I joined in April, the first thing that I started doing was scenario planning. And it was an ongoing battle. This is just an example of what I've done probably in the, in the early you know, May timeframe. Um, when we were looking at postponements and, and, uh, and uh, rescheduling of the international races, when we realized that we can't have the team trials uh, in slalom and and sprint as scheduled. And so we start looking at what could potentially be done. And you know, all of that was going on pretty much throughout the entire spring and, and most of the summer. Uh, lots of different and evolving scenarios because of the changing uh, COVID landscape. Now, none of this would be possible without partnerships. I should highlight few here, uh, and first and foremost, um, the Olympic and Paralympic Committee. Uh, Lance Williams, who is on a call, he is my partner at the high performance side. Uh, Katie Baker, she's a partner on the para canoe side. We work together a lot this year, and I must say, I could not be happier. Um, with the river sport in Oklahoma, we engaged early because we were planning to have the team trials there. We start, you know, discussing, okay, and we would delay the team trials. Can we then schedule some camps perhaps in, in Oklahoma? And as we were all learning throughout the summer, what, and what can and cannot be done in the current COVID situation, uh, you know, at the end of the day, we, we ended up with a, with a plan to organize a camp in November. So the camp is still um, you know, planned for, uh, for mid to late November um, in Oklahoma. Similarly, we engaged with the US National Wildwater Center. We had a team and a solemn team and a coach there, national coach, who had no access to the, to the solemn course uh, in Charlotte. So, I picked up the phone and discussed the situation with the CEO there, Jeff Weiss, and we really came to, a, I would say, an amazing agreement and, and, and solution. And they've been just fantastic. They covered all the water time uh, free of charge for the national team this year. So those are the kind of partnerships that are possible when people work together. Similarly with the Near Canoe and Kayak Club, we have a national team members and a coach, Jolt, who worked there with Nevin uh, and other athletes uh, throughout the summer and 
has been supported by the local club there. Uh, on the slalom side, the Potomac um, PWRC, the Potomac Whitewater Racing Club in Washington DC uh, area, similarly, they kept on going, they kept supporting uh, our, um, our athletes and allowing them to continue to, to participate in a sport. And then as we turned our eyes towards Europe, we engage with several of, of national federations. And you know, since Tatsun was the site that was picked for the first World Cup, we looked towards Slovenia and engaged with the federation there who went out of their way to help us get waivers for COVID, to help us uh, um, with um, water time on, on their course, et cetera, et cetera. So, just unbelievable support from, from the Slovenian uh, Federation. And similarly with the International Canoe Federation, we've engaged with them on several things. We, for instance, we are currently discussing how to start paddling leagues, canoe and kayak and para canoe leagues uh, for young athletes in the US. We are discussing how to bring international competitions back to the US. And, and, and how to develop coaches, et cetera. So a lots, of, a lots of good things happened during these tough times. And here are some of the people who make it happen. Dan Henderson on the sprint side has been just fantastic. He, you know, he helps with data, he helps with ideas. Jolt has been uh, on the river, excuse me, on the lake most of the summer throughout this pandemic, working with the athletes, working with some of the, our best athletes also took them to Europe to compete at the World Cup uh, in, in Hungary. Aaron Houston, he's been, uh, as you have heard him yesterday, he's a, just a, an amazing club leader. So he's done a, a, a good job there with the uh, Geek Harbor, and he's done a great job in developing materials that other clubs can adopt to to, uh, to uh, you know, better manage um, uh, functions, et cetera, within clubs. Uh, Deb Page in Florida, without her, our para-canoe team would not exist. She is like a mother to the para-canoe team. So really, really, really good uh, job there. Raffle, our national team uh, slalom coach, similarly, he's been uh, on the on the course in Charlotte, and when necessary, to keep the relationship with the local uh, facility there going, he even jumped in the raft and guided the raft to help them out when, when some of their guides were either sick or, uh, or calling, uh, you know, calling sick. Um, and then uh, last but not least that I want to highlight, he is, uh, it's a Zach Weatherford. He is a a uh, consultant with the USOPC. He works with Lance Williams and I very closely in preparation for the, for the programs that I will uh, discuss in, in a couple of minutes. So I, I'm just grateful to all this and other individuals um, that I don't have the space necessarily to, to highlight here, but you know, without partnerships and without working with people, nothing happens. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you to all of you guys. Now, in spite of these tough times and, and uh, you know, limited competitions, we had some outstanding results so far this year. Nevin Harrison on the sprint side, she reaffirmed her dominance in, in a canoe 200 meter sprint. So she is a, a current world champion and a World Cup champion. So this year she won by a small margin, but she still won a World Cup. Amazing result in the tough times. Equally on the, on the slalom side, Evie Lepford, she's been just outstanding. She won two bronze medals, both in canoe and a kayak in a recent Tatsun World Cup. So amazing results by two very, very young athletes. Nevin is just 18 and every even younger, 16. So 
there is a lot to, to hope for these two athletes in the future. There are some other results that we can all be proud of um, in, in, um, in Tots and Tren Long uh, among the um, uh, men, uh, extreme slalom, he won the bronze medal. Ria Schrieber won the bronze medal among women. Michal Smolin was ninth in, uh, in uh, men's slalom, uh, canoe, uh, kayak slalom, Jos uh, Joshua Zof Joseph, Sorry, it was 10 uh, equally in uh, men uh, K1. And also Michaela Corcoran, she placed 10th in canoe C1. So we, have, we had uh, several finalists and four medals in Tatsun, at the Tatsun World Cup. And there are some other results as you can read on the right side of uh, bottom right. So overall, small participation, small group of athletes that went to Europe this year, but some amazing uh, amazing results and I couldn't be more pleased. Um, now, let me in few words describe a high performance plan. This is, this is a plan that, you know, will lead, I mean, that will guide us and guide our priorities, if you will, uh, from now to Paris. And the way I describe it, I will say there are three main components to it. The first and the most important is the elite athlete retention. And I'll talk in a second in more uh, detail about that. The second part is the athlete and coach development. And the third one are the leagues and races. So when I talk about retention and why the retention is so important, we need to start with the end in mind. Look, there's only eight years to LA, only four years to Paris and less than a year to Tokyo. So you can imagine that we already know, at least on the slalom side, probably all the athletes that could potentially compete in LA 2028. Definitely we know everyone who could compete in Paris and, and, and Tokyo. So what we need to do as a, organization, as families, as friends, we need to do everything possible to retain these athletes and keep them in a sport. So the biggest challenge that we see is the transition from high school to college. And the retention of uh, retention and education programs will be developed uh, for these athletes and, and families. We need to show, in my opinion, we need to show the athletes and the families possibilities. There are possibilities for partnerships with colleges. There are possibilities with partnerships with universities and other national federations like Slovenian that I just mentioned earlier. There are ways to get our athletes to stay in school and study either domestically or to study abroad. And those are the kinds of things that we will work over the next couple of months and you know, over the next years, all the way to LA and beyond, hopefully, to retain our elite athletes in a sport one way or another, to give them the opportunities that they need to, to see that you know, they can be students, they can be um, you know, employees, but still stay uh, in the sport. Um, if I move to the second one is the athlete and coaches development. It is really a, a, a multiple things that we can do and we are already doing. So as I mentioned, uh, we partnered with USOPC and, and Lance and Zach are helping us currently to put together a modern physiology program and and other elite performance um, programs uh, for slalom and sprint, sprint athletes. And we're gonna kick off that in Oklahoma in, uh, in November. Uh, we're gonna do assessment of athletes. We're going to look at you know, their physical, uh, their um, um, 
medical histories, etc. And Zach, perhaps during the Q&A can add to that. Uh, we also going to work uh, over the next four years to educate athletes and coaches, to give them the tools and understanding that they perhaps don't have today. And similarly, we are already engaging with ICF. We have five coaches right now, ACA coaches enrolled in L3 sprint coach classes. And we will work uh, next year with the uh, ICF to develop a uh, slalom coaches uh, program here in the US. And more broadly, we need to figure out a, a method or a, a way to engage uh, closer with the uh, US Center for Coaching Excellence so that we can take the advantage of the tools and, and methods that have been developed with, for other sports and figure out how we can adapt them to canoe and kayak and para canoe. And, and the third uh, goal are really leagues and races. We can't imagine having a lots of athletes if we don't have racing. And we need, athletes need racing, we need racing uh, because because without, you know, it's really hard for athletes to, to practice and practice domestically and go for, you know, if you're a junior one year, uh, one race or a few races a year. I mean, that's not sustainable. So we need to figure out a way uh, how to rejuvenate regional racing in both slalom sprint and, and para canoe, but also to create new models for racing. And there are cer certain models that have been or concepts that have been developed by both ICF and some other national federations. Um, you know, ICF developed a completely different model of racing for the Youth Olympic Games that's been hugely successful in 2018 uh, and prior. And I've just got hands on, on a very, very interesting model from New Zealand where they're doing something very, very similar. They realize that you can't have athletes in you know, super tippy boats on, on a sprint side at young age. So they have figured out they need, we need to uh, you know, adapt our thinking to, to make it more fun and not just challenging, but also fun. And so we need to uh, develop these concepts for leagues over, the, over this winter. And hopefully the COVID situation next year will permit us to kick off a couple of leagues uh, in the US. And we're gonna partner, ACA is gonna partner with those uh, clubs or regional recreational departments that are willing and able to support it. We will not go somewhere where we can do one event or two events and then everything is still on us. We need to figure out and we will figure out a way to partner locally so that the local organizations then take um, the concept, develop it, and then we learn, collectively learn from it. And then we can replicate the learning in different, or in different um, localities. And also we will, you know, once the LA 2028 spins up a little bit more right now, they're primarily in a marketing mode, but once they spin up more, we will need to engage with them to secure the venues, not just for sprint, but also for slalom and to build the excitement in the area in Southern California for the canoe and kayak, because we need that excitement to be built so that when the games happen, we have the local fan base uh, as much as possible and make it, uh, uh, make it exciting, both for athletes as well as for, for spectators. Um, let me give you a little bit of a preview for next year. Again, this is current schedule. We hope that we will stay this way, although I am, you know, I'm very, very cautious about it. Um, especially because of the situation in South America. I am concerned about the continental qualifications, both for slalom and sprint. Uh, if they're gonna happen in Brazil, we should know that by end of this year, because otherwise we will need to develop some contingencies. Um, 
but you know, let us assuming that we can get COVID, that the world can get the COVID under control. These are the key uh, competitions. So um, in March, uh, we are planning uh, the week of the 20, weekend of the 20 and 21st, we are planning the Olympic team trials and sprint. Um, I am still gonna reach out to Canadians to see if we can uh, partner and do the team trials together because that would be cost effective both for them and us and for the uh, organizing uh, local organizing committee. Uh, then, you know, if uh, the situation permits, the continental qualifications, uh, which is the Olympic qualifier, are scheduled for, uh, for early April in Brazil. Then the, uh, the, the last uh, qualifier for para canoe is in Hungary, which is also the World Cup for sprint, which is in, uh, in May. Uh, then also in May, it's the last qualifier for sprint in Russia, uh, in Siberia. And just following those qualifiers, uh, not, uh, not too far, um, is in July is the junior U and, uh, U23 and junior uh, words um, in, um, in Portugal. Then you have the Olympics. Then you have, after the Olympics, we hope, to have the US Sprint Nationals, as well as the ICF Super Cup race. And we're going to do that together to make the Nationals, the Super Cup, and as you will see in a moment, also Slalom National, all concurrently, all in Oklahoma, to make this really a, a major canoeing kayak racing festival in the US in 2021. And then following the Super Cup uh, in Oklahoma, there are para uh, Olympic Games in Tokyo in September, and then a, also in September, the World Championship in Denmark. So busy schedule, a lot of it. Let's hope that you know, it can be realized the way it is planned for right now. On the slalom side, something very similar. We, uh, we expect to have the Olympic team trials in Charlotte in early April. Uh, after that, we have continental qualifications scheduled in Brazil, in Rio, then World Cup one and World Cup two in uh, uh, Ger Germany and Prague. Uh, th there is uh, expectation that the junior and U23 worlds will be in uh, Tats and Slovenia in, in July. Uh, that is to be confirmed. Then there are the Olympics uh, in Tokyo, then the slalom nationals that I already mentioned that we will do concurrently with sprint in Oklahoma. And then you, then we have two more World Cups, one in Seoul and one in Po, uh, uh, and, and the final World Championship in Bratislava, Slovakia. So again, a lots of, uh, and these are just the major competitions. There are many other level three um, level three ICF races uh, uh, that, uh, that are not listed. Uh, just for your information, what we are gonna try to do actually this weekend, uh, hope, I mean, still today, hopefully, if not uh, in the next few days, uh, we will enter our Olympic team trials as level three, as well as the US uh, slalom nationals as level three uh, ICF competition. That would open then invitation for other nations to participate in those two, um, in, in those two competitions um, and hopefully bring up the, the level. So before I turn over to q and I want to acknowledge two people that have been extraordinary for me in the last, uh, and, and organization for the last, uh, uh, in the last six months. Jackie Nipper, she is an extraordinary volunteer. She has done an amazing job on the, uh, on the sprint nationals. And I've just discussed with her uh, and she's willing to take on a major job for next year to take care of both the sprint nationals as well as the slalom nationals in Oklahoma, which would be a huge undertaking plus she volunteered for a team trials also on the on the sprint side. So um, with you know, 
I could not be more grateful to Jackie, but I also recognize that Jackie can't do everything alone. And with that, I want to, uh, you know, open this and make it clear to everyone, we need more volunteers. We need volunteers for committees. We need volunteers for ACA working groups. We need volunteers for race and events organizations. We need volunteers to learn how to judge and officiate and then to progress and get certified by ICF so that we have new, younger judges officiating internationally, US judges officiating internationally. We need club leadership. We need club management. We need people to participate in fundraising. We need people to support athletes. We, I'm sure we have doctors, we have sports psychologists in, in our mix. Let's flush those people out. Let's figure out who are they, or if they, if they are not members of the ACA, how can we make them members and, and get support to our elite athletes who desperately need it and other athletes, uh, you know, high performance or high potential athletes that, that would greatly benefit. Also, we ACA needs legal support, needs accounting support, CFOs, attorneys, please join us, help us. So that's, that's uh, what I want to uh, say here. And then last but not least, he's going to be surprised because he sent me a picture just a minute ago, uh, Lance. <laughs> so I really want to thank Lance uh, personally because uh, he and his team three at USOPC have been just fantastic to me. An excellent partner, a trusted advisor that I can discuss openly things with and, and get uh, get feedback and, and get an advice. And, and never, you know, last but not least, I mean, his team is one of our major source of funding for, for elite athletes. And I want to acknowledge that and thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lance. And with that, I am done with my formal presentation and I will open it to everyone for Q&A. Um, so Rock, this is Mary McCurry. Um, I'm gonna try to turn my video on, but I don't have great internet. So we'll see how this goes. The, you can, we can hear you too, it's fine. Okay, awesome. So um, on an immediate need, um, as a parent of a U23 slalom athlete, um, we've done obviously training camp for a number of years and usually it's the week of Thanksgiving. But so far there's really been not anywhere we can find any direct communication on where that is. And I know that's because it's not firm, but can you at least speak to like, Mid-November, is it still the week of Thanksgiving? Should we be adding extra time? I just need to get hotel rooms because, you know. Okay, so let me let me clarify. So because of the COVID, uh, we are not doing the camps as we did them last, uh, in the past. Okay. We, were, we, we will um, uh, organize the protocol. We've discussed it with the, with the team members um, and so they are aware of the dates. Uh, once, we, once we go through the club uh, athletes, uh, that, that um, you know, those athletes that may not be within the, the uh, cutoff percentage, uh, then we will go down the rank, if I put it that way. I, I don't know if I perhaps uh, uh, muddled my answer a little bit here, but we are preparing a spreadsheet of athletes that we will invite and we will organize um, accommodations and COVID testing. So it's not going to be like you can arrive whenever you want. It will be uh, uh, scheduled for all athletes to arrive on a certain date and, and also when they will be tested and, uh, and what's going to be the protocol. So uh, all that information should come out in the next, I will say three maximum four or five days, okay, but not longer than that. Okay, so let me just summarize because it is, I understand it's gonna be very different. So as a, as a parent of an athlete who's on the U23 team, but may not on the senior team, you're gonna do uh, a list of here's who's coming, here's the order. Um, if right. 
events you will add as we go down that list. Um, and then we as parents do not need to be doing accommodations, but it's an 18 hour drive. So typically I go and drive with him. So I'm not exactly sure what happens to the drivers at that point. I will answer. So okay. right, I just received late last night, a uh, um, few more questions from Oklahoma that I need to answer. And the only way I can answer is I need to look back to the coaches, get through the list of athletes, as I said, okay? Uh, and then once we know who we can accommodate because we're gonna have two water sessions that are gonna run uh, one after another. We, we cannot run more than 18 athletes per session based on our experience from in Oklahoma because of the space, et cetera. So uh, there's gonna be a cutoff of 36 athletes total. And that includes the national team athletes as well as all the club athletes from PWRC. Uh, Colorado, Idaho, etc. Okay, so we we're gonna collect all of those that information, and then we will uh, we will see. There are two plans. Okay, so let me explain this. So, the national team athletes will be also evaluated in in Oklahoma. The rest of the athletes will just have a training camp. So those athletes that are going to be evaluated in Oklahoma. They will all arrive either on the 15th, most likely on the 15th, uh, and they will need to be ready for the COVID test early morning on the 16th of November. Can I interrupt just for clarification? Because yeah. I think there's some, there's some confusion, at least among some of the younger athletes when you say national team, because they interpret that, that to mean if I've been to Worlds, I'm on the national team. So you're using that term differently. Okay, so let me clarify that. So we are the first priority we are giving to those who are competing in Europe this year, okay? The next is those who have met performance criteria last year. At team trials. At team trials. So meaning percentage, right? Correct, okay. correct. Okay. All right. And then, and, 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 and after that is uh, are all the other club athletes, but not every athlete necessarily will get into uh, evaluation program that we discussed. Right. So club because there is a there is a maximum number that we can accommodate, and and we will we will publish all of that. It's going to be very clear. Okay. So last question here. I hope. So you're using another term called club athletes. But yes, that's P PWRC as an example, for instance, when Sylvan comes with the athletes from Washington, D.C., he has some very young athletes like, you know, I don't know, 12 years old or something like that. That's right. what so, they call club athletes. OK, so we have a bucket of athletes and I'm only pushing this issue because there have been athletes at a couple of team camps who were actually on the junior U23 that did not meet percentage, but were clearly in that middle between met percentage and what we would call the younger club athlete. So I'm assuming they are being considered because not all of them, you know, there's some out of, um, where are they up in the Northeast that have, you know, random coaches. So I just want to make sure that all those athletes, because it was a big to do a couple years ago about athletes getting missed that actually had been on the junior team for several years. So I don't want- Well, uh, well let, let, we need to understand what we speak about. If an athlete competes at the world championship, yeah. doesn't mean that he is a national team athlete. We are considering, if you look at our selection criteria, the national team athletes, only those athletes that meet performance criteria. There are other athletes that can compete because there is no one else, because we have uh, something called the Ted Stevens Act also that governs uh, the, the selection. But it is, if, if an athlete is not meeting the performance criteria, it's different than those athletes that do meet performance criteria. Okay, so I just want to clarify with the ones that I've, that the parents that have been asking me questions because I've been out at a lot of the US uh, Whitewater Center training. So there yeah. is a lot of confusion. <clears throat> 
So they'll look at, they will look at who's met performance. Obviously I get that part. And then they will look at probably last year's team trials. They'll look at up and coming clubs. Cause not, again, not all of these athletes, some of these really good athletes, we've got some out of Colorado that don't fall into the bucket of standard coaches. So I want to make sure it's going to the athletes, not being funneled through a couple of coaches. Cause that's how people got missed before. Okay. Well, we will we'll publish criteria and you'll see it. And then, you know, but I can tell you one thing, there's a limit to what we will invite because of the space. And uh, it's going to be based on criteria. Okay. So you will be providing accommodation. Yes. Well, um, we will not provide, we will organize. People organize, will sorry. To, <laughs> people will. Yeah, we will. Yeah. Pay. Parents will, parents will be paying for it. You will organize it. They will, the, yeah. the, First group will get there for their COVID testing because they're the ones that will be um, that you'll need there on the 15th. There'll be more details coming out in three to five days, and the athletes will still be responsible for getting themselves there um, by the date. Yeah, that let, yeah. So let me. I will communicate that, and so I think we need to move past this discussion. Sure. But, uh, okay. So uh, we will communicate that uh, to the broader. Um, a community and it will be very clear that those who those athletes that are going to be evaluated they are aware of it already okay okay awesome excellent thank you any other question comments hi rock this is kathleen McNamee. i'm the head coach at the washington canoe club and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the um, what's going to happen with the juniors for next year. So trials and are they going to be with the seniors at the Olympic trials or how's that going to work? We have not worked that out. So I, okay. I can't answer. Um, okay. but we've, been, we've been discussing it and I hope to have an answer for you, you know, in the next few weeks. Okay. Uh, just a, a little of my two let me, let me just tell you, let me just tell you what the concern is. Okay. The concern is that because the team trials are so early yes. in, in the year that the juniors that live in you know areas a little bit north um, would be significantly disadvantaged given that uh, the junior and U23 championships are in July. So we are looking at the possibility to organize the junior and U23 team trials closer to, um, to the international competition. Okay, that's great. Cause like we we're one of those clubs that we're far enough north that we typically don't even get on the water with the kids until about mid March. So that would be really early for us. So thank you for that consideration. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, Rob, could I just add something? Um, with regard to juniors and under 23s in sprint. Sure, uh, please. Do not, I'm Charles Lutman. I'm on the ICF Canoe Sprint Committee and I'm chair of the Pan American Canoe Sprint Committee. Um, do not be surprised when the program comes out for the junior and under 23 world championships. If you see a program of events that only has 500 meter and 1,000 meter events for men and 200 meter and 500 meter events for women. Uh, there seems to be a push at the moment uh, at World Championships, and this could also apply for the seniors in Copenhagen at the back end of the season, that there will only be two distances per gender. And the, pres and the present thinking seems to be, although nothing's fixed in stone at this point, that it will be uh, 500 meters and 1,000 meters for men and 200 meters and 500 meters for women. That, of course, may affect how some club coaches uh, approach their training year. Thank you, Thank Charles. You. That's, uh, that's good. I mean, that synchronizes, synchronizes the events with the Olympics, basically, right? Well, the 2024 Olympic program is also up in the air at the moment. We've been thrown into a certain amount of chaos because the IOC has come to the ICF and 13 other sports 
uh, telling them that they need to, that their number of quotas will reduce, athlete quotas will reduce. Uh, obviously, we don't know what that amount of athlete quotas are that, that are going to be lost to the uh, canoe slalom and canoe sprint. Um, there is a bit of a delay on at the moment because of something going on with regard to boxing and wrestling, I think. Um, but sometime between now and the end of the year, we're going to be presented with effectively a bill from the IOC saying you need to lose so many athlete quotas for the 2024 Olympic Games. And based on that, we're going to have to adjust the 2024 Olympic programs. Uh, th that's an uh, interesting information, Charles, uh, because when I discussed the 2024 Olympic program just uh, last weekend here in Tatsun with the slalom side. Um, the chair of the slalom committee told me that there is a very, very good chance that the slalom program in Paris will actually expand, but with the same athlete quota. Yeah, so the, not, what, what not, the, not change the quota. Go ahead. What the IOC have said is that they are open to additional events provided that does not require additional athletes. Yeah, that uh, makes and sense. The, but uh, the, what I'm hearing is that slalom may lose four athletes, sprint considerably more. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so that it, it would go from 24 to to 20 per event. Is that what you're saying or four in total? Well, I, I think what I've heard from slot, I mean, and, and none of this is set in stone. This is subject to considerable ongoing discussion at the moment. And the what I'm hearing is that uh, slalom would lose one athlete quota place per event. Okay. So, mm -hmm. You know, one man canoe, one man kayak, one uh, woman kayak, one man kayak, you know. Just... Yeah, okay. Thank you, Charles, for that, all that information. Anyone else, questions, comments? Zach, do you want to talk a little bit about, perhaps about uh, the, the planned uh, program in, in uh, Oklahoma? Sure. Thanks, Rock. Uh, thanks for uh, inviting me on. Uh, super interesting to, to learn more. Uh, I've got some gapped years with uh, working with Canoe Kayak. I, I worked with uh, the national team back from 2000, 2004. So I recognize a lot of faces and, and names here on, on the call. Um, it's very similar to Rock. Um, I came on board with Lance and his team as a consultant or contractor. Uh, back in, uh, in, in, uh, in the winter, uh, February and March, and then started, you know, trying to really get our heads wrapped around some, uh, some ideas around uh, high performance testing evaluations, as well as coaches education, and then also helping to monitor training. Um, so in Oklahoma, we hope to, to roll out and we will, we'll roll out a uh, comprehensive sports medicine, sports science uh, evaluations um, to, to make sure that we're monitoring or testing athletes and then also providing resources for them <clears throat> as they continue through their, their training year. So a heavy focus will be put on not just some dry land training or testing, uh, but also on the water um, and, and focusing on some physiology testing that we've done uh, periodically with the national team in the past. And I'm open to any questions or or uh, and questions and answers uh, in that regard. All right. Lance, do you want to comment on anything that you've heard today from this group of people? Um, well, again, thanks for inviting me too. And um, it's been interesting to hear kind of some of the other inner workings around um, the program and, um, and where we're headed. Um, I just want to comment and say I'm excited about trying to get in on kind of the ground floor of introducing um, 
some of these monitoring systems, learn from you guys as to what's important to measure, and um, just really try to put the foundation together um, on a professionalized approach towards um, these young athletes and, um, and your overall program. So um, thrilled to be a part of it and uh, excited to see where it's gonna go. Thank you, thank you, Lance. Anyone else? Rafael, do you want to comment anything or? I have Beth? a quick question. Uh, yes, Sylvan. Um, do you have any update about the restructuring of the subcommittees specifically for, I'm interested for the slalom uh, committee? Uh, you mean ACA subcommittees? Yes. Um, I do I not. Do I think that what we are going to if I can predict, and Beth is here, she can comment on, on, on that as well. But what I would assume is that through this election period, we will stay the way we are. And then starting pretty soon after this meeting, uh, annual meeting, we will start working towards the structure that is gonna be required of us by end of 2021. Because on the, uh, at the end of 2021, we need to be compliant with the new uh, update to Ted Stevens Act that um, it is yet to be signed, if, I'm, if I understand correctly. I think it was passed by uh, um, the House and the Senate, but if, I don't think it has been signed. At least I haven't seen uh, yet the news that it was signed by the president. But once it is uh, in effect, uh, we need to, we will need to uh, align. And uh, the major change that will happen is that all the committees, uh, designated committees of the NGBs will require 33.3% athlete representation versus today's uh, 20%. And then, um, I've, you know, I've developed already a proposal for Beth and the board to consider in terms of how the committees would look like, uh, but we need to make sure that we spell out uh, roles and responsibilities very clearly so that it is uh, uh, clear to everyone, um, you know, what are uh, the roles and, and what is the scope of the responsibility that can be delegated to various committees, which to today, uh, ACA lacks. I mean, there is uh, there is uh, lots of uh, gaps. I would say in our um, in our governance documents, and uh, we need to we need to improve not just the letter of the law, but also the spirit of the law. So we will will work over the the next uh, twelve year, uh, twelve months, maybe a little more, to to get that uh, solved. Is that uh, answering your question, Sylvan? Uh, yeah. Thanks for now. I think just. Uh... I'm asking because I believe that the structure of the subcommittees can have a relatively big influence on the retention and uh, the volunteers that are coming and working in the sport. Correct, correct. And just to add what, to what Rock said, we, um, after our membership meeting today, we are starting um, our board meeting, um, which will be several hours this afternoon, as well as tomorrow morning. And this, the committee structure is on the agenda for that board meeting. So we have a lot of work to do on that front and then we'll have to revise our bylaws. So um, that's something that's very much on our radar. Before we, before we conclude, I also just wanna publicly thank Rock I think everyone who's on this call will agree that ACA's competition program has come a long, long way um, in only a, the few months since Rock arrived. I am so grateful for him and for all that he has done. And um, I'm just so excited and um, impressed with um, the progress we've made so far um, with the, how organized everything is, with the relationships that Rock has strengthened and um, repaired actually. And um, it just, it's just so exciting to hear about all the progress and all the plans for the future. So thank you very much, Rock, for everything you're doing.
Thank you. And I will Thank tell you. you all, he works like 16 hours a day, seven days a week. It's unbelievable. Hey, uh, hey Beth. Yes. Um, can you hear me? It's Mary McCurry. I don't have great video feed, but um, I had one other issue um, that I think is really important to all of our competitive athletes. Um, and that is in the area of judging. So I got my national judging certification years ago, but with no races having happened and then us going immediately into, you know, team trials and Olympic trials, um, I think some, some leadership, um, even if it's as simple as a link to some of the ICF training videos, but I don't want us to get to, you know, early next year and we've got a bunch of volunteers who've had no training, who are trying to shove it in the night before. Um, you know, some kind of leadership in that area. So there's a couple of, you know, key people, I'm sure, in each area of sprint and slalom who could potentially at least answer some questions of where is that training located. But right now, you know, when I talk to other parents and people at the U.S. National Whitewater Center who've been watching, you know, the athletes training and I'm like, yeah, you know, you should volunteer, but you know, they can't just show up the day before and us give them five minutes of training. It's really not fair for the athletes to not have good judges on the sidelines. So I'd like to kind of add that in there so that we get a link on the ACA site that says, if you want, you know, if you want this training, here's, here's some online, um, Here's some online training courses that explain how to how to do that. Thank you, thank you, Mary. Uh, we'll we'll take care of that. And um, and just to to clarify a couple more things. I mean, we just submitted, or we will submit in the next day or two, because the deadline is approaching on the thirty first of this month. Uh, the ITO submissions for of, to ICF at least on the slalom side. I, I haven't seen it for the sprint, so I can't comment. Um, but um, you know, the judging on the slalom side has improved thanks to technology. If you go to the World Cup races today, um, there are very, very few uh, missed calls because you have video and, and video reviews. And I believe that we have now uh, in the US also access to most of that technology. So, you know, a lot of, uh, of the stress, if you will, that existed in the past years uh, uh, with respect to judging, uh, it's going to go away with the, uh, with the added technology. So, uh, but what you said, we will definitely make sure that uh, you guys have the information. Also, all the judges need uh, not just uh, learn uh, tools uh, about slalom or sprint, they need to be safe sport certified and they need to be, uh, um, uh, uh, the background checks need to be completed. So it's not just like, you can't call someone a day before uh, to come and judge. You, this is uh, something that needs to be planned a few months in advance. And, uh, you know, for those who have been involved with the uh, preparation actually for 2020 Olympic trials, uh, you know, maybe you haven't seen it directly, but we worked with OKC for over three and a half months to come up with a MOU and, and all of that. And that's how we're going to, I mean, we will recycle some of those documents from last year and this year uh, for, for, for the future, because we, we can't have things orally agreed. We need to have things documented. And once we document it once, we can reuse those things and update and improve. And that's how the processes work. And, uh, and that's, how, you know, that's how we should and must behave going forward. That's great to hear. Thank you for that. All right, if uh, we don't, Rafael, you are talking into your muted mic. Okay, here we are. Um, a couple of things. Uh, first, I want to second what uh, Beth uh, said about uh, uh, Rob's role. And uh, I've been involved uh, for a long time in, um, in this canoe slalom in the US. And then uh, got to say that, uh, that, that, that the changes made by Rock in the, in the program are significant and visible, uh, at least on the slalom side. 
and uh, especially last, uh, I don't know, seven, eight years, it's been going downhill slowly. And, um, and then uh, only yeah, last couple of years that, that uh, Rock got involved, that, that, that the changes in, uh, in the program are um, really visible and, uh, and uh, very positive. Thank you, Ralph. Definitely, yeah. <laughs> I, I appreciate that. And then um, helping everybody in, uh, in the program, especially athletes. And, uh, um, and the second thing is uh, regarding that evaluation for a uh, question for Zach. Um, do you um, um, uh, think of, um, or did you plan on, on having a psychological evaluation for athletes? Or uh, if, uh, if not, is that something that we can uh, um, maybe look into the, um, in the future, if, if, if not for, uh, for this camp? Uh, thanks, Rafael. Um, yeah, I think that is, is an important piece uh, for this particular camp. I, I think we're going we're gonna to pass on that right now because we, um, there's, there's only so much that we can do given uh, some of the restrictions. And we need to, I do have some experience in the past of, of doing some uh, of the neck up, if you will, type of evaluations. Um, and we need to kind of vet that a little bit more and see how we could roll that out in the future. So for this particular camp, no, but in the future, I have been thinking about those type of things. Uh, and to your point, Rock, if you know, those are you know, those ACA uh, members that are out there that have that type of experience, um, certainly open to connecting with them to uh, understand a little bit more. Absolutely. Hi, Dan. Hi. Well, I, I wanted to uh... Uh, echo Raffles um, comments uh, in support of rock. Um, I've been involved with Sprint for over 30 years and seen ups and downs and downs <laughs> and downs and downs. And, and uh, I really felt like um, since rock came in, the program has really turned around um, the, there's been really good foundation building happening this year. I think that that will pay huge re rewards as we go forward. So I really appreciate that happening, but I also appreciate the concern for ethical conduct and fairness um, that has not always been there. So um, thanks. Thanks Rock and thanks Beth for making that happen. Thank you. Well, we are, I think, just about out of time, unless uh, uh, people have questions, maybe one, two more questions, and then we need to close. I have a quick question for Zach. Uh, do you expect in Oklahoma to uh, have any time available for national team athletes who are not directly involved in, in the evaluation to be included in maybe some interpretation of the results or if they have any, any personal questions? Uh, yes, uh, that's a great question, Sylvan. Uh, so I've been working really closely and then another member of uh, Lance's team, uh, Lindsay Golich, who's our uh, physiology expert, uh, as well as a, a, a dietitian. So we're gonna have the resources to run um, uh, you know, educational sessions uh, each day. It's something that we need to plan out uh, a little bit more. We got a little bit of time to do that, but it is a key point um, to, if we're going to do any level of evaluations, testing, if you will, that we get almost immediate feedback. Immediate feedback is not possible, but, you know, within 24, 48 hours that we're giving feedback to the athletes and the, and the coaches, um, because that's the key point. If we're going to evaluate, we need to educate Training is going to happen regardless, but then we had need to have a monitoring uh, position in there and monitoring tools in order to give uh, that feedback on a regular basis. So, uh, yes, Sylvan, uh, open to any suggestions. If, if people that are not there, they can call in. We can do a, uh, you know, obviously like this, a Zoom with an understanding of uh, one, why we're doing what we're doing, why we're doing um, these evaluations and how this is going to help the pipeline 
um, not just the elite athletes, but the development athletes as well. All right, thanks a lot. Any other questions on that from anybody? All right, then in, with that, thank you everyone for taking the time on Saturday morning. And uh, well, I hope to see some of you in Oklahoma and the rest on the next um, Hollywood Square, as we call Zoom, right? So <laughs> take care, guys. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Rock. Thank you. Bye-bye.